Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. So glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Two good martinis today. We didn't have any yesterday, so two good martinis today. And one crazy for conservatives. We're brought to you again by ExpressVPN today. Secure your online activity at expressvpn.com slash martini. Much more on them a little bit later in the podcast. And Jim, internet security plays very well into our first martini today, but not necessarily in the entirety that Katie Hill wishes it did. Katie Hill, of course, is the former California congresswoman who was really forced to resign by Nancy Pelosi before her case could go before the Ethics Committee. Um, She was uh, the one in the photos with the staffer, nude, hairbrushing, all sorts of things. Um, And she says she was the victim of uh, revenge porn from her estranged husband and so forth. Very sordid story on a number of levels. But Katie Hill has recently written a book, and now that book is being turned into a movie starring Elizabeth Moss of The Handmaid's Tale, And Deadline has the story. It says, the book tells of Hill's experience as a young woman with no prior political experience, whose charm and common sense won over the people in her district and thrust her into the halls of power in Washington. While her brash confidence won her powerful allies and infuriated her enemies, it was privately concealing a cycle of domestic abuse she was trapped in at home, infamously culminating in the release of intimate photos and the revelation of her own admitted personal mistakes that would eventually result in her stunning fall from grace. So clearly it's a story of how she's the victim. Some folks aren't buying that though, including Katie Hill's former staffers who somehow got access to her former representative Katie Hill Twitter account and put together this thread that was released in the early morning hours Eastern time today. Katie's former staff here, disappointed in so many folks, including Elizabeth Moss and a couple other folks uh, involved with the movie regarding today's announcement. This is an incredibly sensitive situation. We appreciate the instinct to defend our former boss, an LGBTQ plus woman who faced abuse from her husband. What happened to Katie Hill shouldn't happen to anyone, but this moment requires more nuance as Katie Hill's story, our story, is also one of workplace abuse and harassment. Katie Hill can be both a victim and a perpetrator, and staff can experience severe consequences for speaking out against their powerful boss. No one should have to put themselves in harm's way for the public to understand a simple truth. Katie Hill is not a hero for women. We deserve heroes who embody our values, even in the most difficult moments. Katie Hill was never investigated by the House Ethics Committee, nor has she been held accountable by anyone other than herself. We encourage everyone to reflect deeply before taking her word at face value. Katie took advantage of her subordinates. She caused immense harm to the people who worked for her, many of whom were young women just beginning their political careers. Workplace abuse and harassment can take many different forms, but one thing is certain, it is never okay, even if your boss is a woman and or a survivor. Believe us when we say it's not only about who starts it, it's also about who ends it. And while Katie is certainly the survivor of abuse, we are not confident that she sufficiently acted to end her own patterns of inappropriate and abusive behavior. Enough is enough. In order to advance the Me Too movement, we must be willing to acknowledge the problematic behaviors among those in our own communities. Only then will we see true progress. So kind of a long thread there, Jim. But uh, the idea that uh, the story is cut and dried, Katie Hill uh, was the victim in all of this and uh, railroaded it out of Congress. There's a lot of people who know her well who say there's a much different side to this story. You know, Greg, uh, it's a long thread, but it is glorious. And uh, again, I think what's, you know, like there's just something eye-popping about seeing this, you know, very detailed and clear denunciation of Katie Hill's wrongdoing coming from the Twitter account labeled Representative Katie Hill. Um, And as, you know, somebody said, one of the lessons of this is if you're not going to use a Twitter account anymore, lock it up. Alternately, this is why I don't think I will ever have anybody else writing tweets for me. I understand certain lawmakers may find it, you know, necessary to give their staff access because they themselves can't tweet. But you know what? This is what what can happen when you do that. Greg, if I had to summarize the single most dangerous aspect of our era, it's a bipartisan problem. It's the desire to choose to believe the narrative over what actually happened. 
Uh, you still see people who will claim Al Franken got railroaded out of the Senate and that somehow this was very unfair to him. And, you know, you can't really get around the fact that there are now, I think it was like, you know, seven women, eight women who came forward of allegations of inappropriate touching and other circumstances in which he had made them uncomfortable. And it wasn't an awkward comment or something that was well-meaning. This was, this was reaching out and grabbing and stuff. And the infamous case when they were on the uh, tour to, to visit the troops and things like that. Um, I'm also thinking of Harvey Weinstein uh, and how when he, the initial report of the New York Times came out, you may remember that statement in which he, you know, he gave this really half-hearted, mealy-mouthed semi-apology. And then he said he was going to rededicate himself to fighting the NRA. Liberals know that if they get caught with their hand in the cookie jar, that there are lots of other people who will not want to dwell on this and who will want to give them a pass because they're on the right side. They vote the right way. They support the right causes. They donate to the right organizations. And this you know, is like the old day of the church and the selling indulgences. Like, yes, I've done these bad things, but I have paid money to the right people so that I should not be held accountable. And, you know, when something like this comes along, and it's somebody you liked, it's somebody you preferred, you have a choice. You can either say, you can either go along with it and say, well, he does so many other good things, you know, I can't forgive, you know, I can forgive this. Let's look at the fullness of their lives and, and blah, blah. Or you can say, you know, that doesn't really give you a pass for what you've done here. I'm thinking back to a couple of years ago, the gifts that were going to Bob McDonald, the, the governor of Virginia. Greg, I don't know if you, I voted for him. I was a big fan of him. And once you do this sort of stuff, you really, you know, you, can, you have a choice. You can either say, he's swell, he's terrific, and none of this stuff matters. This is all a plot by his enemies or something. Or you can look at the facts. And if your guy did something wrong, you have a choice there. You can basically decide that the partisan affiliation is the single most important factor in your judgment of a person. Or you can say, you know what, no, even though you're on my side, even though you're the party I, I support, even if I've praised you in the past, you've done something wrong and you must be held accountable for it. We can debate whether Katie Hill's resignation was the appropriate response. I would point out that, like, as noted in that series of tweets, the House Ethics Committee never really got a chance to investigate this. And the House Ethics Committee could have come back and said, well, this is what happened. This isn't that bad. Or, as many of us suspect, the House Ethics Committee could have come back and, you know, metaphorically thrown the book at her. By resigning, there was nothing left for the House Ethics Committee to do. And I kind of feel like, you know, this is so she's done this. And I suspect Katie Hill now feels like she made the right call because she gets to play the victim. And she has found partners in Hollywood who are very eager to advance this narrative that whatever wrongs she did was not really that important, that she was not abusive or inappropriate of her staff, that she did not take advantage of her subordinates, that she is not a Me Too story as much as all the other figures who uh, resigned in disgrace, but that she was a victim of, I don't know what they're going to say, pure, because uh, Moss is involved, my guess is it'll be, you know, uh, Puritans or something, religious extremists who are anti-women and anti-sex or something like that would be my, my suspicion here. Look, this is a story of sexual harassment, and I suspect that tele, that biography film is going to do everything humanly possible to avoid the fact that the story of Katie Hill is a story of harassing subordinates. Well, yeah, I mean, the, her argument, I believe, was that she never acted inappropriately with an actual staffer. I think she said it might have been a campaign staffer. But right here in the thread, it says, Katie took advantage of her subordinates. She caused immense harm to the people who worked for her, many of whom were young women just beginning their careers in politics. Jim, I don't think it takes a lot of parsing to understand what's being said right there. And uh, Yeah, and I don't, I, it's been really fascinating to see the number of people who wanted to defend her. And you wonder if they genuinely believed this. When they started arguing, look, it would be morally unacceptable for her to take advantage of an office staffer. But a campaign staffer is totally different. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> the only difference is that the House Ethics Committee has more direct authority to weigh in on things she does in, in a congressional office than they do in a campaign. Morally, and I think in terms of, of our ethics and standards of behavior, I don't think there's a significant difference. There, there's no law that, there's no, no concept of morality that says you absolutely must not sexually take advantage of your subordinates in the office. But in the campaign office, eh, it's fair game, do whatever you want to do. Yeah, she's trying to split hairs there. So uh, very interesting. I I'm sure it'll still get a, a glowing rollout. Uh, it's going to be a streamed movie. I don't know which streaming service is going to have it, but uh, 
nonetheless. Uh, the, the point here is well taken, though. If, in fact, it was her estranged husband who released the compromising photos, that's wrong. But again, Katie Hill's actions can't be washed away just because of what her estranged husband may or may not have done. But when you're using the internet, social media, or whatever, you want your privacy protected, whether you're Katie Hill, whether you're Katie Hill's staffers, whether you're anyone, you want your privacy protected. And it's like that in the other parts of your life as well. You close your curtains, you close your doors, you even close the bathroom door, right? Of course, using the internet without Express VPN is like going to the bathroom and not closing the door. Did you know, for example, that your internet service provider, whether it's Comcast, Verizon, or anyone else, knows every single website that you visit? And what's worse is they can sell this information to all sorts of ad companies and tech giants who will then use your data to target you. ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity cannot be seen by anyone. You should be using ExpressVPN on all your devices because it works on everything. Phones, laptops, even routers. So everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can still be protected even if they themselves don't have ExpressVPN. And the best part is using ExpressVPN is as easy as closing the bathroom door. You just fire up the app, click one button, and you are protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by CNET, Wired, The Verge, and countless others. So if you're like us and you believe that your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash martini today. Use our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash martini. Don't forget the slash martini. And you can get an extra three months of that security for free. That's expressvpn.com slash martini. All right, Jim, as we mentioned, Elizabeth Moss is the uh, star of The Handmaid's Tale. And of course, that's the narrative that the left wants to paint about Amy Coney Barrett. And it turns out uh, that sometimes that phrase is used in Catholicism. I bet you didn't know that as a Catholic, that sometimes uh, that phrase is used. And so uh, a lot of people who are ignorant about Catholicism are are beclowning themselves as they try to dig up something uh, nefarious about Amy Coney Barrett. But the good news is, is that it's not working as we look at our second piece of uh, Good news. Uh, According to Morning Consult, uh, they have polled all voters, Democrats, independents, and Republicans about Barrett's nomination itself, as well as when this confirmation process ought to happen. And her numbers have improved just in the week since her announcement. Uh, All voters supported the nomination 37-34 on September 26th. In a poll taken October 2nd through 4th, it's now 46 to 31 24% of Democrats now support it, with 52% opposing. It was uh, 59 to 14 against uh, before. Independents were underwater, 31 to 28 uh, against it initially, and now they're supporting it, 36 to 31. And Republicans, no surprise, love it, 77 to 7. But then there's the other question, when should this process take place? Initially, it was very much split. It was uh, 40% saying, She should only be confirmed if President Trump wins the election. 39% say, let's go forward now. Now it's 43%, let's go forward now. 37%, let's wait. So, uh, Jim, as your boss, Rich Lowry, uh, has recently written, the left is throwing everything it can at Amy Coney Barrett and nothing is sticking. Yeah, and and I think this, you know, in addition to being good, you know, a good martini and good news, I think it's really kind of surprising how fast, because we're talking about the better part of a week. And, you know, overall, you're seeing a 10-point number. And I think what's interesting is that's not really being that driven by Republicans. Republicans are already pretty positive on her. It jumped from 71% to 77%. You know, that's good. Uh, I think some people might wonder why it's not higher. Uh, you know, an eight-point jump amongst independents, that's fine. But what's really fascinating is the 10-point jump amongst Democrats. And the point where, you know, in a highly polarized era, Now, roughly one out of every four Democrats believe that Amy Coney Barrett should be confirmed. And, uh, you know, I think she had a a perfectly fine rollout. I think her remarks were terrific, and they all went fine. But let's face it, we've had a really busy news cycle in that past week or so. And so I kind of wonder, Greg, if if opposition to Amy Coney Barrett was all, it was always going to be a tall order for Democrats. You may recall me saying a couple of weeks ago, if you're Democrat, take the loss and then look forward to the Democrats you can, the Supreme Court justices you can replace if Joe Biden 
is president for four years or if Kamala Harris takes over at some point in that process. You know, that like there really wasn't any way the Kavanaugh confirmation fight backfired tremendously, completely galvanized and unified Republicans, probably cost him a couple of Senate seats. You know, don't don't be like Sisyphus trying to roll this up this hill. You know, I recognize that they picked a really terrific uh, nominee. I can't, I've not seen any scandals. I don't think you can paint her as a religious extremist. I think all the Handmaid's Tale stuff is kind of insulting. This, you know, this isn't going your way, Democrats. Don't, you know, focus on the bigger fight for the presidency. Don't, you know, blow yourselves up on this one. And I, you know, I don't know whether they're necessarily following that advice, but I do think it's interesting that like with the president's, you know, positive uh, diagnosis for the coronavirus, hospitalization at Walter Reed, his departure, his return to the White House. Look, that has eaten up the news cycle. And I kind of wonder if Democrats aren't saying Amy Coney Barrett is the worst. Amy Coney Barrett is a menace to your rights. Amy Coney Barrett is some crazy, really, blah, 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 blah. You know, if they're not doing that, then the instinctive Democratic hostility to her kind of fades. And you end up with results like this. We're like one in four Democrats, like, no, oh, okay, she's fine. And you end up with, you know, Democrats, uh, independents being evenly split uh, and, and opposition, you know, that people go from not knowing or not really having an opinion to kind of liking her a bit more. And the numbers get a little bit better amongst Republicans, but, you know, they're already pretty good. Like, that's the best explanation, that in the absence of a furious, you know, Kavanaugh-level opposition, people are generally fine with Barrett. And, you know, that, that's really good news, but it also is kind of a very interesting indicator that the Democrats can fight Trump or they can fight Barrett, but it's going to be very tough to do both and they may have to prioritize. And in the absence of that negativity, the public looks at Barrett and says, yeah, she's a really accomplished woman. Sounds like exactly the kind of person you want to have in the Supreme Court. So uh, rare, you know, lately it's been kind of crazy lately, uh, Greg, but this is, this is really, this is the best bit of news to come out of polling in quite some time. No, I, I definitely agree. And, and Jim, the, the Barrett nomination brings to mind that uh, we're not getting younger. Uh, technically, Neil Gorsuch, I think, is Gen X, even though he's he's uh, got the gray hair and everything. Kavanaugh, as we all know, was uh, a high school graduate in 1982. Uh, so he's technically uh, the very edge of the baby boom, I think. And so Amy Coney Barrett, born in the 70s, graduated high school and college in the 90s, is really the first absolutely deadlock Gen Xer to be up for the uh, Supreme Court. And so it's just a sign that uh, Gen X is coming to it into its own now. And I saw one funny comment on Twitter back when she was nominated that uh, her first dissent should just be one word, whatever, as the, as the first Gen <laughs> X uh, Supreme Court justice. There you go. Our generation is finally represented, Greg. Hi, I'm Sarah Carter. On every edition of the Sarah Carter podcast, I say we're taking back the story. And that's exactly what we have to do. Whether it's the Russia hoax, the relentless attacks on President Trump pretending Antifa doesn't exist, or covering up for the repressive Chinese government, the mainstream media isn't interested in the truth. It's up to us to uncover the truth and share it with others. Please join me in taking back the story on the Sarah Carter podcast. Subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So let's go to our crazy martini now, Jim. And Republicans are playing a lot of defense, not just uh, on the White House in this election season, but also in the U.S. Senate. Republicans have the majority, but there's a lot more Republican-held seats in play than there are Democratic seats. Uh, we're still hopeful of, of picking up the seat in Alabama. And there's, there's always hope that Michigan voters will wise up and see that John James is exponentially better than Gary Peters. But I'm not seeing a lot of polling that's backing up that that idea at this point. But in addition to the Republican held seats that are in serious trouble, Maine, Arizona, I, w I would have said North Carolina until this week, but that story just gets worse and worse for Cal Cunningham, like we talked about yesterday, and there's been even more since then. But even some uh, seats that you would think would be safe Republican territory are also very competitive, like Kansas, where Pat Roberts is retiring. Roger Marshall, the more moderate Republican, won the primary against Chris Kobach. And the Democratic challenger is a Barbara Bollier. She's a state senator, uh, and a lot of people are, are presenting her as a moderate, but I'm pretty sure we heard that about Kathleen Sebelius at one time, too. So anyway, she was doing a uh, video chat Q&A with, uh, I guess, supporters, maybe some undecided voters, and uh, she took a question about the Patriot Act, and uh, here's how that unfolded. We had one submitted by Joanne that wanted to know your position on the Patriot Act. 
I haven't read it yet, Joanne, <laughs> specifically. So um, tell me what specifically you want to know about that. Well, my concern is that the extraordinary powers that were given to the executive branch under that. Oh, oh for the and perhaps they need to be reviewed and um, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead then, Barbara. I think you're I think what you're talking about is the ability to impose uh, tariffs, et cetera, unilaterally. Yes, I'm very, very opposed to that. It has to be reexamined. So, Jim, my favorite part there is that she had no idea what the Patriot Act was and then got a little bit of a sliver of an explanation. And before actually understanding what it did mean, she thought it uh, focused on the president's power to unilaterally impose tariffs. So she made it perfectly clear she had no idea uh, what she was talking about. So I don't know if this will be much of a moment in this campaign, but uh, uh, it's pretty clear that this is not on the forefront of uh, Barbara Bollier's uh, uh, vision of what needs to be done if she's elected to the U.S. Senate. You know, when I saw this yesterday, I had put out this question saying, so is she just not that well-informed or does this mean the Patriot Act isn't that controversial anymore? And a lot of people said, oh, you know, Jim, of course she's, she's not well And Look, she may very well be just, you know, uh, not the sharpest knife in the drawer and, and not a particularly bright bulb and uh, some sort of evolutionary missing link. Put in whatever insult you want. You know, if you're running for the president's or you're running for the U.S. Senate in the year 2020, you should know what the Patriot Act is. You can love it. You can hate it. But, you know, the idea of having no idea what it is and thinking it was related to the president's trade authorities, uh, it's, it's a pretty embarrassing mistake. And, you know, if you're the Marshall campaign, you should be spotlighting this clip and setting it far and wide. But I kind of wonder if one of the, you know, kind of hidden lessons of this is that for those of us with long enough memories to remember the arguments about the Patriot Act and this idea that the Bush administration is going to be going through the libraries and knowing what books you check out and, you know, John Ashcroft is looking under your bed and, you know, this, this, this hysterical, furious reaction that we heard throughout the Bush years. And oh, by the way, then in the second term of President Obama, we learned that the National Security Administration was gathering enormous amounts of information about Americans online and their online activities and their metadata of their cell phone calls. Um, that, that by the year 2020, the Patriot Act is just, it, it's just become normal. It's now been around for nearly 20 years. It's not a, a point of outrage. It's not something Democrats spend a lot of time beating their drums about. It, it's been reformed a few times. I think most civil liberties advocates will say that it's better now than it was back then, but most uh, the libertarians over at Reason Magazine and, and places like that and Cato Institute are never going to love this. They're never going to say, oh, the Patriot Act is terrific. Uh, Rand Paul still makes a big issue out of this, but it's now, I think it's safe to say it's not amounted to much. And I don't know whether it's because we're just not as worried about the government snooping in our privacy. I don't know whether it's we're not as worried about terrorism and there's less discussion of the Patriot Act or whether it's an idea that people can get used to almost anything. But I think it is really a vivid dem demonstration that the Patriot Act has been out of the headlines for so long and has been out of the public debate for so long that a, you know, Democratic candidate who they, they think has a decent shot at winning doesn't know what it is. And, and even <laughs> somebody else had the, was it you, Greg, had the observation that you can either, you know, when you don't know something, you can ask. Or you can guess and hope things turn out well, and oftentimes they will not. Yeah, she just was so desperate to make sure she didn't look like she didn't know that she made it blatantly obvious that she didn't know. And, and so you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell from the, the Zoom, uh, but uh, Barbara Boyer is not some 20-something or 30-something. And of course, you've got to be 30 to be in the U.S. Senate. Uh, so she's 62 years old, which means she was in her 40s when the Patriot Act was passed. So it's not like one of these situations where it's a 20-something a reporter who had no idea what Whitewater was covering the Hillary Clinton campaign. This is a woman who's been, you think, around politics long enough to remember the 2000s when this was pretty much a front and center issue. But uh, I guess not. And it just kind of, I don't know about you, Greg, I start wondering what, like, you know, white hot supernova controversies of the year 2020 are going to seem like no big deal come the 2030s. Some of them, well, <laughs> just, we just don't know which ones yet. 
Well, this year has just been such a fire hose year of uh, big stories. I'm sure some of them will get lost in the ether over time. But uh, yeah, I- I'm guessing a generation or two from now, we're going to be rolling our eyes pretty hard at the things that the younger people don't, uh, don't understand and don't remember. All right, let's talk. Oh, wait, that is the end. Uh, that's the end. I thought we had more martinis. It's been such a fun day. Unfortunately, it's just three today. Uh, Jim, uh, vice presidential debate tonight. After a little bit of a kerfuffle, plexiglass going to be in place. Um, what do you expect from the Pence versus Harris blockbuster tonight? Uh, look, I, I think the ratings will be a little bit higher than usual for a vice presidential debate because, for obvious reasons, people are very interested. Uh, the president is, thankfully, it seems, on the mend from the coronavirus. but. Uh, as his doctor said, uh, God, was it Monday? Was it Monday, Greg? This week feels like it's been a decade. <laughs> the doctor said he's not out of the woods yet. Uh, you know, you never know how this, these things are going to go. Hopefully he'll come through just fine. Uh, and obviously Joe Biden is getting up there in years and turns 78 after the election. So the two people on stage tonight might very, you know, probably have better chance than normal of at some point becoming president of the United States. Um, I think if you were frustrated by the president's performance last was it last week, Craig? My last God. week. Anyway, that, that feels like it was two decades ago. Um, then, you know, you're going to probably appreciate Mike Pence's more even-keeled and uh, less interrupting style. He is a consistent conservative, and he's always done a pretty darn good job of articulating the conservative message. And I think a lot of Democrats will actually be happier with Kamala Harris than they are with Biden. She doesn't trip over her words as much, and, you know, she's pretty darn progressive. I think it's going to go at each other hammer and tongs. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the other thing which I think probably a factor, I wrote about this in the morning jolt. Uh, people don't remember, you know, there, there was a probably comparable level of hype or, you know, to uh, Mike Pence taking on Tim Kaine. By the way, for listeners, Tim Kaine was the Democratic vice presidential nominee in the year 2016. I mention this because almost everyone has forgotten this. It was the most wild and crazy election of our lifetimes, and nobody remembers him being there. But the, Pence, I don't want to say he mopped the floor with Tim Kaine, but you know, there was a broad consensus that Pence did a fa- really good job and that he had probably done a better job making the case for his guy uh, than Tim Kaine had done for Hillary. Now, was it decisive for the race? Probably not. You know, vice presidential races pro- debates don't usually have, but you know, it generates a good one or two good news cycles, kind of reassures people. And it would not stun me if we had another similar one. Uh, ha- Kamala Harris will come out aggressive. She came out aggressive against Joe Biden. And yet, you know, I think we saw in those debates, she didn't always have a great night. Um, so I think by the end of it, Democrats, Democrats will obviously immediately tell themselves that they did fine. And they'll probably do fine. They, they're running ahead. This is, you know, the, deba- the race is largely going the way they want. But um, here we go. This is where we are. And, uh, you know, I think is that, you know, by the end of the, you know, by tomorrow morning, Trump fans and the Republicans will be feeling a little bit better. And Democrats might be feeling a little less confident about the 2020 election, but their confidence is pretty darn high. Do you remember what happened in that debate four years ago where Tim Kaine wouldn't shut up? And stopped it and then kept yeah. interrupting uh, Mike Pence the entire time. So yeah, well, that was before, well, that was when Democrats were pro interruption. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they were with Biden in 2012 in the vice presidential debate, too. So we'll see uh, what, what uh, folks can get away with tonight. Susan Page of USA Today will be the moderator. So uh, I'm sure plenty of eyes will be on her as well. Jim, enjoy, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please remember to visit our friends over at ExpressVPN and protect your online activity, expressvpn.com slash martini. Please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast. Also, we're very grateful for any uh, five-star ratings and kind reviews. We're very, very thankful for those. Also, get us on those home devices. You can just say, play Three Martini Lunch podcast. And join us on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.